So uh, let's go around for the purposes of camera and let's do quick this time, maybe just uh, say who you are, uh, particularly, uh, you know, everyone say what they do, the officers will say maybe your role, uh, what you do in the department and then uh, for the community members, you know, maybe tell a little bit about how long you've been here and, and what you do in the community. And then let's go on, Jen, I have a couple prompts and things that I think are kind of taken up on what we talked about last time. But after we do introductions, if anybody has something burning or something they want to uh, kind of present to have us talk about, it's open. I've been really pleased at the respectful nature of the conversations and the good faith. But within that, you know, it's all open. Uh, you know, we're trying to get down to the nitty gritty. So uh, my, my opinion is don't hold back, no pull punches. If you have something on your chest about public safety, about police, about race, let's talk, because this is as safe an environment I think, I think we're going to get to have those conversations. So I'll start. I'm Kyle Dotson. I'm the director of uh, police transformation in Burlington. Been doing that for five and a half months. And when I'm not doing that, I'm the CEO here at the YMCA. Uh, I'm John Murad, I'm the Acting Chief of Police uh, at the Burlington Police Department. That's it. <laughs> Eric Radeville, I'm a detective at Burlington Police. Uh, I've been there for 10 years. Rashi Eddins, I'm a, a poet and facilitator. I use spoken word and performance art as a tool to confront white supremacy and to affirm common humanity and also for youth mentorship and positive affirmation of community. I'm sorry, just real quick, I think it's important that Eric lives in Burlington. This is something we talk yep. about. Our own detective in Burlington, he lives in Burlington himself. Please. I'm Lucy Young, I'm a community member, I'm born and raised in Burlington, and I'm a college kid. Uh, my name, uh, I am a sergeant. I've been here for about uh, a little bit over 16 years. I'm Wayne LeBrack, I'm the acting deputy chief of operations. Uh, at, uh, Police officer in Burlington for 20 years. And you grew up in Burlington? And I did grow up in Burlington <laughs> until I was like nine or ten. So. I'm Craig Mitchell, um, local DJ. I live in Winooski. Uh, came here in 1989 to go to school at St. Michael's College, graduated in 93. I'm a DJ, um, singer, uh, music producer, and I uh, try to do as much community outreach and social justice work as I can um, in the ways that I do it. And I help start uh, Winooski Strong, which is doing very, very well to. Uh, help inform uh, about what the needs are of BIPOC communities, as well as to help fund some of their hard work that they're doing, um, you know, out in the streets and, and, and trying to make change in that. I'm Joe Poro, uh, patrol officer. I've been with the department total a little over uh, eight-ish years. Um, and I grew up in Essex Junction, so born and raised here. Sorry, Tracy, and I lived here about 30 years, thanks to my sister, who doesn't live here anymore. Uh, um, from New York City, which, totally different beast. Um, yeah, and I've just tried to, you know, have influence in town just by doing what I do, you know? and being a part of it, so, yeah. I'm pretty sure you just wanna point out, I think uh, Tracy represents uh, the movement where we want the conversation to go. So um, from last time that we got together and there was a little spot on um, the news and so Tracy saw that, she reached out to me and said she wanted to be a part of it. So we invited her in. Uh, from this, there's gonna be more CX coverage and I hope that more people will come in We'd love to bring in new officers. Thanks, Joe. So Joe uh, was talking with his colleagues, and he said that he'd like to be a part of it. So we want to grow this. We want to have this be as broad as possible, uh, get as many different stakeholders representing different perspectives about how we help to transform the police and how we get better alignment between community expectations and what BPD understands is their job, and hopefully in that process, grow trust uh, and connection. So with that, why don't we jump right in? I don't know, I have some, some thoughts, but does anyone have anything they want to uh, cover? I, I just want to say, please, please, just as a community member, thank you to the officers and the chief uh, for being here and being willing to be open and willing to, to be vessels to, to accept information, also to disseminate information, to hear what we have to say and we're willing to hear what you have to say, and I think this is a safe space to do that. So I appreciate all the folks that are here, especially the folks that haven't been to one of these meetings yet. 
And that's the point of that disseminating information piece, so I don't want to speak for him, but I would say that the positive buzz about these conversations that officers appreciate the opportunity to be heard and to share their piece, I think got back to Joe and, and made Joe say, hey, I, I could be part of that. So I think that's important to point out, Craig, that we want officers to want to come talk with community, be part of these conversations. Um, right, and we, so yeah, we need to hear, we, we may think we know how hard your job is, but until we're in your shoes, we don't know. Um, so with that said, we want to hear how hard the job is and the things that are scary and the things that freak you out, things that put you on edge so that we as, as folks who are commoners <laughs> don't uh, have a better idea um, when we're thinking about policing and what needs to change and what doesn't need to change. And that's, thank you for saying that. It's super important that that's two ways, too, because certainly the, I think the things that we heard both in the previous conversation we had on the phone and then the one that we had here two weeks ago now were both important. I know that the, uh, Deputy Chief Lebrecht said so. Uh, the, the, the idea of hearing how encounters are perceived from the other side and how, how interactions go from all sides is, is incredibly important there, too. It's certainly not, this isn't an opportunity for officers to say, woe is us. Uh, and it's not an opportunity for the community to say it either. It's, it's just a, a chance to move forward. And, right. you know, I'll be quiet I'm not supposed to be talking about these things <laughs> anymore than, than the direct announcements. I'll let you know when you speak to us. Uh, <laughs> uh, any burning topics? Anybody want to? Is there something you want to address? If not, I've got thoughts, but also. Right, so let's jump in. I thought, uh, why don't we start with the issue of staffing? Right, does everyone, uh, just to give a, a quick primer for people, uh, what I'm speaking about is the resolution uh, in June at City Council uh, voted to decrease the size of the Burlington Police Department from 105 budgeted sworn officers to 74, it's approximately 30% reduction. Uh, one of the, ultimately in this time of uh, defund the police, abolish the police, uh, arguably Burlington is one of the more aggressive, so an actual 30% cut that went through. Uh, would be one of the more aggressive places in, uh, that happened around the country. Um, and so we're now at the point, uh, I'll let uh, DC LeBrock or the chief uh, um, kind of correct me, but I feel like the last number I heard is 78 effective. So we are uh, now, um, and, and that, you know, it gets a little complicated, but there are 78 officers available to go out and patrol the city. Uh, so from 105, there are now effectively 78 available which puts some squeeze, puts pressure on things. And I thought it might be interesting to have a conversation, uh, get people's thoughts about, please feel free to share your thoughts about uh, defund generally, um, what happened here in Burlington, if you have thoughts about the number, if you have thoughts about the information that's come out about the number, the way the press has covered it. Uh, once again, my sense is no holds barred. Whatever, if you've thought about uh, police staffing, then I think we should talk about it here. Okay. <laughs> there we go. I don't know what I can say. All right. So, aside all of the other things I feel, I'm going to put those on the shelf for now. As someone who works in this town, till at least three in the morning, I'm sorry, how many people did we lose? And guess what? It all comes down to the times when I'm still working and other people that I know are still working. Well, guess what? When something happens and we need help, it's not that the, the police department couldn't, but if, if the staffing isn't there on third shift, it affects more people than people who's, who want these cuts to happen, realize is, I don't know. And that scares me to some degree. Like, aside from all the other, you know, the other things that it's, are separate right now. And I can, I, I, but as a bartender who, and the other, you know, folks that I've wor I work with or have in the past, um, that's that kind of. I, I, and I can help bolster your case. Uh, so I was, before I became a police officer, I was actually, the last job I had was the manager at Sweetwater's. Okay. Um, 
And when I was in college at UVM, I worked down at Barnes and some that no longer exists, like the last chance. <laughs> The original, oh, wow. Aches, yeah. the original Finnegan's on yeah. uh, St. Paul Street and mm -hmm. Ake's Place on a, when it was there, uh, down where on Main Street where Lansing's was. But um, yeah, that's that's a definitely a, dark, a, a dangerous, can be a dangerous time of night. Uh, the other thing is to help you out with the staffing too. You know, we have 78, but that actually includes all our detective bureau, the airport, and the supervisors. So really the number we have right now available that are gonna work the road next tour is 39. So there's Two shift day shifts with eight people on it on either side. Yep. There's a evening shift with seven people. There's another evening shift with eight people, eight officers. And then the two midnight teams, we've managed to bolster up to four officers on each midnight team, um, which is a, still a safe number. But once we, as police officers, drop below a certain number, it's not safe for the police officers to, to be out there too. So. Yep. Yeah, out of that out of that seventy eight, there's really only thirty nine plus the supervisors with them. Um, so that you know, we'll bump it up maybe another uh, uh, eleven more. So a total of um, uh, fifty uh, total cops, including their supervisors, that will be able to work all the shifts that cover the downtown, or sorry, the city of Burlington. I should say. So yeah, just a so the basic experience of being involved in the nightlife. What, what have you observed? What's been your observation of the Burlington Police Department? Good, bad, indifferent. How do they interact? What kind of things do they do? Uh, and what, what would your characterization be of how they show up and interact with the public? Well, it's a, mostly good. A little bit of a mixed bag. Um, and I think my one constructive piece that I can definitely bring to the table is reminding people that we are not the enemy. The people that work for the downtown, the restaurants and bars are not the enemy. We want to help you guys do your jobs. And I only say this because the, the very few not so great interactions that I've had or I've seen um, it could have been approached a little different. Some, some things when it came to interacting with like bar staff or whatever, or downtown, and if you needed help, it's, we're not that unapproachable is what I'm trying to say, I guess. And, and how can we fix those things, I guess, is how, you know, like, how can we be a part of the positive process? You know, it, I guess I'm, I don't know if I'm conveying things well enough, but like if you look, if you know something happened downtown and you're looking for video, you know, someplace like even ESOX has video camera. Come to us. We can, you know, but you, it's a simple interaction, I guess, you know, of like, hey, we're here to help and not hinder a situation that may escalate to where none of us want to go. You know what I'm saying? And I, so, yeah. But anyway. Is there anybody who has uh, any uh, sympathy with the defunding? Anyone who thinks there's something to be looked at as it relates to the numbers and perhaps uh, there is a call for decreased numbers. So the, the one thing that I want to convey, really related to defunding, um, I think the CSOs and CSLs is a great idea to a point. I think the thing that's not being conveyed very well though is we don't want the amount of numbers we had because we don't want the CSOs. The officers want the amount of numbers we had because when we have a shooting or a stabbing, that's how we can make that scene safe. When I have eight police officers to make the scene safe prior to our detectives showing up, that's huge. And that also, you know, I know one of the big reasons for defunding is they want less officers on the road. One thing that they want is less officers out there so there's less chances of using force, right? And I totally get that. That, that in a simple concept makes sense. The problem is, is the less officers you have on a scene, the more force is gonna be used because it's, it's less safe. Can you walk me through that? No, I don't think the public yeah, it, it seems counterintuitive. Why 
what, like there's a shooting, there's something goes down. Why do we need eight officers? So a shooting's pretty pretty simple example of that. Uh, if it if we're responding to a shooting, we need to secure the perimeter. We need to talk to witnesses. We need to detain suspects if there are any. We need to gather evidence. And if we can't secure that scene, that whole case can go out the window because there's no way to to when we go to court later, they can say, well. Your scene wasn't secure, so there was evidence tampering. There was this, there was that. What was like that involved? What's a secure scene? Look secure like? scene because it look like first we have to get if we have the ability, we'll get crime suit tape put up, and you're going to have officers on multiple parts of that scene, actually on the perimeter. You're also going to have officers inside helping collect evidence. You're going to have officers inside that are going to be wit uh, collecting witness statements. Um, you're going to have officers inside that maybe let's say it's a, a house that was just somebody just got shot in house. They now have to clear that house, and what that means is they have to go inside and make sure that area is safe and there's nobody else inside. It's gonna hurt you and nobody else needs needs aid because that's another huge issue so when we show up on a shooting if somebody is hurt we do render aid immediately if we can whether that's putting on a tourniquet placing a chest seal um whatever we can do to help until the fire department it's safe for them to come in and that's the other thing the fire department can't come in until we deem that scene safe and they won't come in until we deem that scene safe so that slows down the response time for them too if we don't have enough officers to do that and it'll take a lot longer for us to make that scene safe if we don't have enough officers for that situation and the other thing is, you know, four officers, five officers on a midnight shift might sound like a lot, but when two of them are going to a domestic over here in the south end, right. then there's two in the north end at a domestic, and now you've got the sergeant trying to handle, you know, a downtown call for a fight. Now you've got the officers spread thin everywhere. We're trying to call for mutual aid, but although the other cities around us aren't as busy as us, they're still busy, and they only have two to three officers if they're, you know, if they're lucky, and they're dealing with their own stuff. So calling for mutual aid is almost impossible most of the time. A lot of times we get we get the we get some mutual aid and we, they're like we can't come we don't have the ability to come right now. Um, they'll come when they can. Uh, we had a, a scene the other day um, on North Street where there was we had an individual somebody thought thought a gun had been fired um, in a house and we got there it kind of evolved into what appeared to be a mental health issue. Um, it took my entire team, uh, including some day shift officers, so you're looking at over ten officers, and then two sergeants, so 12 officers total, plus UVM PD came down and helped us do traffic. So that's one or two more officers. Just for that one scene where we determined there hadn't been a gunfire, it was somebody in mental health crisis. Um, but to get that scene safe enough to determine that, we needed that amount of officers to do that. We don't wanna go to, we know we're not as well trained as a social worker to go to mental health calls. We don't wanna have to go to those. We want to go with a social worker. But prior to getting to that point, if it's, if it's that type of situation, we have to figure out the scene is safe to do so. And the only way we can get there is if we have enough officers to do so. And it's faster that way and safer for everybody. Is this contextualized, Joe? How long did that North Street from start to like, when were, when could cops disperse? How long were people tied up? It was about an hour at least. And everybody on, on shift at that time was tied up. So, um, and that one was good because the person that needed our help was asking for our help. So it went a lot faster, but if you're looking at like an actual standoff with somebody who's mm -hmm. who's having a mental health crisis, that can be hours. Um, and that's gonna tie up the entire shift. It may cause us to call in more officers from home to come in early. It may call cause us to call in detectives to help us too. Um, so you end up with a lot of a lot more officers than I think people realize. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to see, like even when you're even if you're standing outside of that scene, you can't see all the officers working where they are. Um, and I just think that's the biggest thing. Like we don't want we don't want we don't want to saturate the city with officers. We don't we don't want to like have this show of force. We just want to make the scene safe that we're on. Um, and it also, if we have that ability to actually make those scenes safe, and then we still have more officers, that also makes it able for us to actually do other things besides just respond to calls, like interact with the public in more than just terrible situations. Because when do people call us? They call us usually on the worst day of their life or on a really bad day, and we don't really get the chance to have that interaction in their time which also can make it difficult when we show up at a fight and we're looking for video and such, right. you know, and that's not, that's not, that one interaction may be the only interaction you ever have with a police officer. And every officer I work with is always trying to be the best they can at all, all times. But when you work a 10 hour, 12 hour shift, sometimes you make, you make a mistake, you, you slip up and you say something or your little, your tone's off and it shouldn't be. Um, but we know that that one interaction may be the only interaction we get with you to change your mind about how a police officer acts. And sometimes we make the mistake of, of having the, the wrong tone or we say something the way we shouldn't have and we've ruined that interaction. Um, and I know any officer that's been in that situation comes back to PD after and says, oh man, I wish I'd done this this way. 
Um, but we have more chances to do that if we had enough cops so that we could actually be out oh, in the community. The yeah. If we can actually be out in the community interacting when we're not just going to calls. Um, and right now, I mean, thankfully COVID, I say thankfully COVID, which seems weird, but thankfully the last year with COVID, our calls have been down a little bit. So it hasn't been quite as crazy, but as soon as we go back to normal, normalcy, the calls are gonna go back through the roof and we won't, we'll just be going call to call all the time, so. I'm curious, you know, this is, this is, you know, sort of nitty gritty. So what I heard Joe say is that one can make an argument that uh, more officers actually allows for the kind of policing that it seems like communities are asking for. More officers allows, uh, is what Joe's telling us, it allows for the kind of control uh, and securing of a setting that um, allows for greater safety. Uh, it allows for time to um, be out creating relationships, interacting with the community in proactive, positive ways. Does everyone buy that? Does anyone uh, have any sense that, that that doesn't jive for you? So this is an argument that, that if we want to get to better policing, at some level, more police will allow us to do that. Just for clarity, too, I'm not a use of force. I'm not a use of force instructor myself. I'm a patrol procedures instructor and a couple other. I'm an instructor actually in de-escalation, too. Um, but one thing I will tell you when I said um, more force can be will be used if there's less officers, that's actually part of a use force continuum. If there's if I'm one officer and I'm dealing with a person, my force level can be may have to be higher in that situation to keep myself safe. Whereas if there's two officers now, I can't be expected to use this level of force. I should be expected to use this level of force, which is lower. Um, so that's that's another reason why more police officers on scenes are better. So things come up that so, so let people people be marinating on this idea of, of numbers and maybe more is better. So we don't want to come back to that. But Joe brought up some other things. Uh, one is uh, he talked about having interactions, and on a given day, an officer shows up in a way that's not optimal, it's not the way they would best want to show up, but it's the only interaction that that person has with that person in the public. So what comes up in conversations I have with officers is, what, what, what's the standard we should have for uh, a police officer as a professional to make mistakes, right? So there's a, there's a in, in other professions, here at the Y, we say you're human. If you, if someone at our front desk is surly or uh, brusque, with a customer they come in, uh, they're gonna have a conversation, but they're not gonna get fired. They're not gonna get suspended. They're gonna have a conversation about our values and about what we expect, and some sense that uh, we need them to be able to figure out what they need to do to show up better for our customers. Is there any um, latitude? Can, can cops have a bad day? Uh, we, we, we're not in your shoes. We don't know that stuff. Um, just like you don't know where someone else is coming from on the other side, and that's where it gets convoluted. And I, I, my question to you would be, uh, when you get those calls that there's a mental health issue on the other side, do you know that before you get there? On all of them, or not really? So I can use that one as an example. We were we were responded to that call as a shots fired call. We didn't know there was any mental health involved in it at all. Thankfully, when we got there and we set up a, a perimeter um, and slowed it down a little bit, an officer that was on scene was like, I was here earlier, this was a mental health complaint, it's so-and-so, and then we uh, had a negotiator on scene to start trying to talk to them so we could figure out how we could help them. Um, a lot of times we don't know, a lot of times the mental health calls that we end up on, a lot of times they come out with something else and they turn into mental health calls. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do know and we take those a lot slower, but when they start out like as a shots fired call, that's a little rap more rapidly evolving. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. so question. Yeah. So, a few years ago, Howard set up a program for social workers to be downtown. Um, you know, and, and there was outreach and, and someone who no longer unfortunately lives in the state of Vermont used to actually be one of these people. And once he left, Downtown never saw a hide their hair of anybody. So is the program still functioning? 
Yeah, they, uh, they are still functioning, but their budget's fairly low and they have very few people to do it. Um, we, we usually don't have them on the, sometimes we do have them on the weekends. We usually don't have them on nights because they don't have the staff to help us. Um, you're talking about the street outreach team, correct? Mm -hmm. They are amazing. Yeah. They do great work. I just wish there was more of them. I, I, I do too, because that is huge. For someone who also lives in the mental health world, <laughs> um, to have that connection to use, I mean, I, 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 it was so easy to not have to like call you guys if I knew Justin was in town or that he was around and I'd be like, hate to bother you on your personal phone, but I can't find your card. Can you come down and, you know, <laughs> and it was great, you know, um, Unfortunately, since <laughs> California, um, you know, that connection got lost. And I, I'd love to figure out how to make that happen more for, for everybody involved, because I think it would help you guys too, like um, uh, hugely. Yeah, they, they still get sent the calls prior to us going. As oh, long good. As it's okay. To do so. It's just there's not enough of them to be on every shift that we work. They don't have the funding. Yeah, mm. basically Justin left, and when Matt passed away, yeah. they their spots were never filled. Oh wow! Because they didn't have the money. Right. So that yeah, Justin was oh, amazing. He was awesome. We he lost. Also, he also okay. worked the evening shift. So yeah, and, and well, he was also a, you know a night owl with the yeah. restaurants, which yeah. is awesome. You know, so it was great. I just. But they do a lot of yeah. They still do a lot of work behind the scenes, like dope. They'll meet with people before they get in crisis. Like, you know, okay. I can speak a lot to Justin because, you know, I would ride around with him. And, you know, Justin was, you know, I remember him, one of his clients' cat died and he transported it in his car so they could bury it. You wow. know, like, that's he, the type of person he was. He was completely yeah. selfless. Yeah. He's like one of, the, one of the greatest human beings I think I ever met. Yeah. Um, but he would, he had a list of people too. He would come into work and he would call them or, hey, how's your day going? Oh, you're not having a good day? And you know he'd be like, you know what? I went and saw so and so. I brought him a soda and a bag of chips, and we would never hear from that person. You know, yeah. Where's it? And that's the kind of stuff yeah. I I know. Living in that world most of my life, it would make your jobs so much easier. Instead of maybe you know, considering. I, I hear the, the talk about defunding. It's like, no, we just need more connections like that to really, you know, also de-stress a lot of everybody's jobs as well. Because if I'm dealing with something and then I have to call you guys and there's that no connection, it just makes it. And it has, it may not even have to do with the fact that I, whether I serve them or not in my establishment. Because we've had those interactions too, where it's, you know, um, especially more so in the summer when, 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 well, we in the Barbas or downtown call, the buffer is gone and the students leave for the summer. And all of a sudden we see that many more faces that we haven't seen for nine months because they're, you know, more closer to home, so to speak. You know, so it's, oh. Just for a record, I don't know if you were both familiar with the street outreach team. It's, it's been around since, uh, for almost 20 years or a little more. I think it was founded in, in 2000 or 2001. It's run by the Howard Center and it includes uh, social workers and people trained in mental health and they are located primarily in the downtown area, but they're out on the street uh, during the day and all the things that both uh, Joe and, and, uh, and Wade have said are, are true. They're, they're, it's not as big as it once was. They're, they're, everybody's talking about a person who was there named Justin, who was just, everyone remembers Justin as being somebody who really, really had a flair for this kind of interaction and this kind of work. But it is, it does exist and it's, it's a team that is routinely called to scenes by police. When, a, when police get to a scene and recognize that we're not, this isn't really up our alley or it's a person who needs some mental health, uh, a care or, or needs to be connected with services that we don't necessarily have, 
we bring in street outreach and they bring us in. If they are at a scene or if they see something happening downtown that exceeds, that turns into a level of disorder that they are not going to deal with, they'll ask officers to respond. So it's a very uh, collaborative relationship between those two groups and, and they work well together. I just didn't want, I, I didn't know if you guys knew what the program was or just wanted to fill, you, fill that in. I had to learn a lot of these things when I came here in 2018 and sort of uh, understand a lot of them too. So. Thanks, John. I'll just add to that because uh, Joe alluded to. So back to the resolution and the uh, decrease in the size of the force from 105 to 74 budgeted officers. Part of the theory was to redirect those resources towards more street outreach type workers, right? So that moved to the nomenclature, which we already had in uh, Burlington. And any of the officers, please correct me if I say something wrong. But so there's two positions. Joe says CSO and CSL, community service officer, community support, community support officer, community support liaison. Is that right? CSO. Community service, service officer. Service, service, service. Support community support service. Officer. Community support is community service liaison. It's community, community service officer, officer uh, which is not a sworn officer, not armed, and is a person who is, does a lot of work that, that supplements what officers do. Animal control issues, some traffic issues, uh, but not somebody who has law enforcement powers and is an existing position that we have two of. And then the support liaison, we have a social worker in the department, We've had, we had two, uh, one of whom was our opioid coordinator and was, was instrumental in dealing with the department's opioid approach uh, and the city's ComStat approach to opioids. Uh, she has, has uh, retired from our department and is doing other work. We have another social worker and we are modeling a new position on that existing position and that new position is called a community support liaison or a CSL and that doesn't exist yet. We do not have people in that role but we want to and the city council has authorized the exploration of that role. It's, it gets complicated about how it's going to roll out or work but that is something that we envision being a department-based pair to and complement to what you see with street outreach um, and not to None of this is a zero-sum game. There is plenty of business, as it were, for all of these roles in Burlington. There are plenty of clients who need assistance and plenty of, of folks who are uh, in a position to be helped by these kinds of roles. Um, but it is an, uh, it's a role that we're creating, and Director Dodson's actually tasked with, with sort of figuring out how that works. So the Chief said, and this is for those who might see the recording, uh, I have been tasked with trying to help us figure out, so there's been authorized additional CSL resources. So one has been created that will be located in VPD. There's been authorization for the creation of two additional ones. And there's a, I'm leading up a process of trying to figure out if it makes sense to locate those outside of VPD. So anyone on the recording, if you see this, if you have ideas, please reach out and anyone here. So this idea, uh, because uh, particularly the city council, some of the people leading, this idea of decreasing the number of uh, gun-toting sworn uh, officers uh, and replacing it with a resource that has more of a social work, mental health background, um, and putting those people out there to replace um, the um, sort of uh, response that would come from an officer uh, with this sort of uh, resource. Want that to happen and believe that that needs to be outside of BPD, that being at BPD, uh, compromises, um, not the neutrality, but and, you know, I'm paraphrasing what I believe the belief is, but there are those who believe that uh, if, if one believes that the issue of decrease in the police is to have less people who are out there, perhaps uh, one not being perfectly suited, as Joe says, but I think there's also, and I'm doing this for uh, you know, uh, provocation in terms of our conversation, but I think there are those who believe that the interaction that officer has is more aggressive and is of a nature that would be um, improved if the person were uh, a mental health um, uh, worker and, and professional instead of an officer. And I'm putting that out there to see if people have thoughts about that. Should we have more of these positions? Should they be someplace other than uh, in the police department? Uh, if they should be someplace else, do people have a thought about where that someplace else is? Um, Yes, but I don't think it necessarily has to be separate. Why would it have to be separate from the BPD? I mean, isn't that? Aren't, I mean, 
I think that anything that has to do with uh, adding to a more relational and humane capacity for engaging and, and serving the actual needs of people in their, in their times of duress is valuable. I think that because of the, the nature of the history and the present day reality and the narrative of how police uh, originated as uh, an institution that was originally to capture former enslaved people and the historical narrative of that to this day is still very much rooted in that same relationship to black people and the descendants of enslaved people here. So very uh, causally from that root, you still have a lot of people who have fear in terms of engagement, in terms of relationship. And I think that needs to have more compassionate approach because it's an opportunity to de-escalate if I know that you're not directly associated with somebody who I perceive as harmful, whether they may be or not. I think it's wise for us to approach things in, in ways that can allow people's fears to be allayed and to have the actual needs and the moments met so that you can find a positive resolution and, and also develop more of a rapport based on mutual trust that has a foundation in active relationship. So I, I could see how those multiple prongs could be useful, you know, in and outside. So that if I know you, I see you in, in, the, in the streets, I see you in and out of your capacity. I have a valuable relationship with you. I trust you. I know you care for me, what the well-being for me, for my family. It's not officious. It's not a power dynamic. I think that can really be valuable and vital to approach it that way. I think that just like I graduated from Millington High School three years ago and I was just thinking that this would be a really interesting and I think beneficial addition to the police like presence in schools. I think that that like just from different situations that I witnessed at the high school when like a lot of people are having hard times and that might have come out in different forms of aggression in the school settings that that might have been a really good de-escalation tactic and just having that support mixed with the like more surgeon that the police officers had within the school, that that could have created a really symbiotic relationship for the students to witness. So there's some interesting things that Lucy and Rajni uh, brought up, but I think part of what Rajni, I like the, the history, right? And the, the, I think irrefutable, I don't know if anyone wants to refute the idea that at some level, uh, the idea of public safety and who was being kept safe back in a time when they were enslaved people, part of it was to, uh, you know, to keep enslaved people enslaved, right, and to manage runaways, et cetera. So what's come up, you know, for me as we watch this, I wonder, you know, what the group thinks, is when, when I talk to, and I, when I would talk to BTD, I would say that um, when we start talking about policing, one of the issues is that for BIPOC folk, I don't think it is geographically or time bound, right? So if, if as a black man, if I had an experience in 2016, where I was completely innocent, I'm driving my car, the cops stopped me with no uh, clear reason that I could see, pulled me out of the car, roughed me up, cuffed me, uh, do whatever, then that's cop behavior. And, and, and I probably, through that trauma, don't really take the time, it's hard for me to say, well, that's just the Cle Cleveland police, and it's just that person. Trauma works in a way that it now becomes, in my experience, and, and I will probably um, tend to um, sort of um, expound or, or you know, uh, um, cause that experience to be more comprehensive than it is in my mind's eye. And I think part of this moment is, uh, I'm asking the group, what do you think about that? In, in terms of, uh, it seems irrefutable, and interestingly, in this moment where we're in, um, uh, jury selection for Derek Chauvin in the George Floyd event um, that uh, is it appropriate to ask the community to only judge Burlington police on what Burlington police do? Is it irrelevant the way police behave elsewhere to our community's transformation or is there some way that that reality should be brought to bear on Burlington? And if that's the case, what's that look like? Why, what, what is the argument for why it is appropriate to bring in these national 
occurrences where even officers, officers will agree that certain of these events were murder or killing. This was inappropriate. This was bad police work. This person should be held accountable. Officers will agree with that. Is it fair and, and appropriate? And will it help us? Does it move us forward to bring that reality that those police do behave in that way and it is problematic? Should we bring it into our conversation? What's that look like? To what degree? How much? I, don't, I think we should, but I just don't think we can expect to hold it to everybody. You see what I'm saying? Does that make sense? Like, yes, we need to look at those things and how we can not go there as a town and use those as teaching tools so that we can, we can move on. Oh, there are so many, but we have, there are so many examples of different things that, good and bad, that, but, but we have to remember to keep the good there too, like as learning tools and not forget that, yes, there are good people in, even in major cities where they have these huge problems where it's, that, that's all they see. The negative is all they see. So I, I, I think it's key to not forget those things or, you know, pretend that they don't exist just because it doesn't happen in that, in Burlington or in, on that scale. So. Well, it's, it's hard to say that it's irrelevant. I mean, as you, as you pointed out, and as we were talking about, you know, everyone brings their own baggage, mm -hmm. their own trauma to a situation. And no one knows what someone's carrying with them when they get there. The, one of the things that we can take with us, um, whether in this conversation or just in life, and, and things that you and I talked about was last week or two weeks ago, we all grew up with the same television. We all grew up with you know, the, the, the bad guy being the black guy who's you know, getting hauled off and carried off to jail and everyone else going, oh, he's gonna beat his ass. So our, our, our ideas of what a civilian should be and how a civilian will be treated by police and how police are going to, quote unquote, treat us, no matter who we are, um, it's all been shaped by what we saw as, as children growing up. And, and unfortunately, there are people who are there in the system who are there for the reason that is the negative. Um, with that said, on the other side, there are folks that can't get rid of that trauma because that one incident that they either saw on television or that happened to them or happened to one of the family members, they're carrying that baggage with them. And so no matter what, it's the woman that we talked about a couple weeks ago that I saw on the news where she was being pulled over, a woman of color, the lights went on, she freaked out and just kept driving out of fear. Three or four miles later, she finally pulled over the cop came over and asked her to open the door and then said, can I give you a hug? I'm really sorry, because she was bawling her eyes out. And that should not be where our, our citizens are feeling about, or how they feel about our, our police officers. Mm -hmm. um, so the, to say that we can't make it about the national, when you watch eight minutes and 40, 45 seconds, okay, that's gonna shape someone's brain. That's gonna make it so that someone's fearful. And I don't, don't wanna be fearful of you or you, and I'm not fearful of anyone in this room. I am, for, I fortunately am Craig Mitchell. I have a little bit more of a, of a stake in this town and people know me. I had the one incident that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, I fixed it, it was done, but not every person of color that moves into this town has the phone number of the police chief and say, hey, can I talk to you? Not everyone has the phone number of the mayor to say, hey, this just happened to me last night, can we talk about this? Whereas I luckily had that to those situations and I, moves that situation into a more positive as opposed to harping on it and, and making it into a negative. So it, it's, it depends on the person and, and what they can bring to the table and what they can't as far as their own personal view. So, I mean, I think that's important, Craig, and it, it makes it, you know, I love people's thoughts about Craig's success is variable. It depends on who you are, but that makes it challenging, right? It does make it challenging because ideally, me and Rodney and Craig, and Vincent and you know uh, the, the boys over here, Olivier, should have the same experience or something reasonably the same, right? I should not. I would probably say that in this town, my experience is similar to Craig. 
it's a fairly high profile position. There's a, there's a, a, a good chance that someone might know who I am or I have a connection or something I could do that, that can play into it. But should it take that? It shouldn't, it shouldn't take that, right? It should just be, so once again, back to, if we do, if it is reasonable to somehow bring the national reality and the national conversation into what we do here in Burlington, what, what's the appropriate, what's that look like? How do we bring it in? Where do we draw the line? We say, well, we consider it up to this point, then we gotta come local. Uh, or, or like Rajni said, is, is there something about the history of policing? There's a, 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 a colleague and a friend, I don't know who, anybody know Rashad Shabazz? I was trying to know Rashad Shabazz was at UVM, and he wrote a book, and he wrote, a, the book was called um, something along the lines of the carceral space, but incarceration, the carceral space. And he did this research where he showed that, uh, you know, in the early 20th century, there were vice neighborhoods, drugs, sex, music, um, prostitution, et cetera, and they were fairly diverse because it turns out that um, the enjoyment of those things doesn't break down along racial lines. So there would be all sorts of, <laughs> there'd be all sorts of diversity in those, in those environments. But over time, it, it appears, I don't know the history of other people, but, but it seems like there was a crackdown. Communities decided uh, that those things weren't wanted. There was a driving out. And then often in those same neighborhoods became concentrated black neighborhoods. And those are places that became uh, you know, housing projects, and then housing project, many people felt like it was a carceral space, right? So, so that's our history, and that's what police were, at least in part, part of the, you know, construction of these spaces. Has that impacted the psyche? Has it impacted the profession? Is it part of how one sees the job, uh, and that we should hold people accountable for that? Um, or is that unreasonable? Like, how, what, what do we do with this? Because this, I feel like this is where we're stuck. I want us to dig in here because I think what I hope for these conversations is, I mean, I like it, but, but it does not, you know, be interested in other people's perspective. If these conversations are just kumbaya, it does not serve us because it ain't kumbaya out there. So if we kumbaya, we're almost like we're kind of wasting our time because we're not getting down to the difficult stuff and the nitty gritty because we have difficult things to work through. I'm hoping that this environment gives us an opportunity to work through the difficult stuff better. It doesn't make the difficult stuff go away. Oh, I'm good. So, one of the things that sticks out to me is in the last year we've seen a lot of things pushed forward and we are, I'll tell you right now, I'm the vice president of the union, we are not against any change as long as it's positive and it's actually useful change. As long as it's not rushed, because that's the biggest thing, if you rush something, it can go wrong really fast. Um, one simple one I'll give you is the legislature pushing for the privative restraint law. Further restraint law makes sense. I should not choke you out, right? That's terrible. That should not be okay. I should not put my, my, I should definitely not put my foot on your neck, but I should not, that should not be something I should normally do. Granted though, if I'm fighting for my life against somebody, anybody in this room fight, starts fighting me and we're both fighting for our lives, and you tell me I cannot use a technique because it'll send me to jail for 20 years, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Because now, what are my other options as a police officer in that situation when I'm fighting for my life? And I think that's something that, when I'm talking about something that pushed too fast, they're, they're now going back on that and they're, they're determining that if you end up in a situation where you're fighting for your life, that, that, that will be okay, but it has to be that exact situation, which we've said all, all along. We agree with that. That makes sense. We, we don't use these techniques. I don't want to use that technique. I only would use that technique in a situation where I feel that I'm going to die because that's the only, te that's the only time it would seem like I would need to do it. Um, but I guess what I'm saying is, is that we want to change and we want to change the way that we do things in a positive light, whichever way it works, but we want to do it together and we want to actually talk about it. Because we've been left out of conversation for the last year pretty heavily. Um, my name was on a sign for six months in the, in, the, in the park. And that gets to you over time, especially when you know that's not you, that's not the person that you are. Um, I was never brought into the conversation though. Nobody ever talked to me. They just watched the video and decided they knew exactly who I was and what I was about. And that's not true. Um, I think you're right. We can't sit here and have a kumbaya conversation, but we need to have a conversation and people need to be real about that conversation. Um, if you watched that video and that made you decide who I was, I'd love to sit down and talk to you and change your mind because that's not who I am. 
you saw a very short video, and obviously I can't really talk about it due to the situation, but you saw a very short video, and I've been working at this police department for almost seven years as a police officer. And that's eight minutes. You know, there's a lot of other things I've done in this police department. There's a lot, of, a lot of arrests I've made. There's a lot of people I've dealt with who wouldn't agree with that video, wouldn't agree with what's been said about me in that video. Um, so my, I think really what we need to do is we need to talk about how can we move forward but where can we come and compromise where it makes sense? And you know, if you, if you leave us out of the conversation when it comes to reform, you and will miss things because there are things that we know because we do this job every single day. We're not against changing anything, but it has to make sense and it has to work. Um, you know, the, the defund, not to go back to defunding, but defunding, admit, I, get what you're, I get what the idea is and I, I want there to be funding for social, for social services. They should have their own separate funding so they can actually stand up on their own. And we should have funding so that we can have the CSLs and they do their jobs and they handle these certain calls. That's perfect. That is exactly what every police officer does this job wants. And we wanna focus on the things that are keeping people safe. That's what we wanna do. Um, so yeah, if we can have these conversations. You know, I, th I, think, I think we have to, you have to bring in the national. You can't ignore it. You can, you, you need to bring in those, those, uh, that information though, and you need to look at what we're doing right now. Okay, this is what happened here. Like Derek Chauvin, for example, I don't know if you all know this, but that technique that he used, for some reason, was in the, the Minneapolis uh, use of force policy. That was, a, that was a approved technique. That technique that he used was approved in their policy. So my first question would be, do we have a technique like that that we approve in our policy? If you go through a policy, you will not find one. We, in our policy, it actually stated, in our use force policy, it stated, you will not use a, a neck restraint unless you are um, in a situation where you are in deadly force. So that would be the first thing, you know. Let's compare those two and see, are they similar at all? What do we need to change about them? Which was done a little bit, the use force was reworked. Um, and then, yeah, going through, looking at the national, the national issue, whatever it was, and actually looking at what we're doing and how we could change what we're doing. I think that's where you start. What can we change what we're doing that makes sense, and what are we already doing correctly? Because that's something that gets ignored too. Are, are we doing anything right? Because for, for all the cops that I work with, it doesn't feel like it. We feel we feel like we haven't we're, we can't do anything right, um, and that's that's hard. It's hard to come to a job interview where you feel like you can't do anything right. It makes you want to stay away from the public because you feel like you're demonized, and it's not fun. Um, and that's that's why we have so many cops leave. Well, sadly, it's, it's sort of like, I'm sorry, but real quick, it, it reminds me of the uh, like a, uh, WWF fight. The bad guy that comes in, and they're known as a bad guy, always. Yeah. And people boo them when they come in, they throw stuff at them, and, ah, we hate you, and then here comes the good guy, bro. But they're both gonna do the same thing to each other once they get in the ring, in that situation. Not saying that this is the same exact thing, but that's, you're always looked at as a bad guy, you're demons. Um, and, and for some folks, after a while, I'm sure that gets to them, and gets them to a point where they are rage and they're like, okay, you call me a jerk, then I'll be a jerk. And that unfortunately is also what happens. And I, I go back to what you said for a second. I love the idea of, or at least I'm thinking about the idea of high schools and, and officers and, and, and uh, social workers inside. I can imagine an officer in a high school that was the nicest person in the world. I'm thinking of Corey. Who, is, is Corey still on the course? I haven't seen him in a while. Uh, I'm sorry? Or Yes. Yes, and, and he's amazing. I love his personality. The way that I've, I've seen him interact with, with students, it's like, hey, officer, it's, he, he's a buddy, as opposed to, I'm scared of that guy. And I think that's more of what's needed. There, there's someone there to keep folks safe, but there's also your friend. So keep an eye on you, make sure you're safe, and what are you doing? Get your butt over here. Let's talk. You know, that kind of stuff, as opposed to, okay, I'm going to you know, pin you down, and now I'm going to be the guy that you saw on television that you're scared of. Well, it's also preconceived notions that in every little community that still has of each other. And it drives me crazy listening, just even on a Sunday afternoon, you know, I have, we were talking about the cross section of people that come see me and I have a bunch of restaurant people that play different music that's not the dance music. And all of a sudden I'm hearing commentary and preconceived notions and that's just, living day to day, forget about, you know, the other, you know, the preconceived notions of, you know, people in a job. 
And it's like, how, you know, I've had to stop conversations when I've heard people be derogatory towards another group. And I, you know, like put in a very plain and simple, you know, words of like, okay, you know, they're, they're clean, respectful, pay their taps. What's the difference? Oh, labels. Mm -hmm. Excuse you. Like, why are you throwing stones? And I think, you know, it makes me wonder we're in the, you know, 20 something century and it's like, we're still, everyone still walks around with that little baggage of like preconceived somethings mm -hmm. of a group of people. And some days I get tired of trying to be the teacher on a daily basis of like not, you know, but, but we still have to do it, you know, and it's how do we change what, and I, I think you have a good point of like get starting younger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and having those interactions in school, like where they see different, how, you know, different perspectives of what an officer might be. They're not going to be, you're changing those perspectives, just living your life as the cop that goes to the school, mm -hmm. you know? So. Uh, just touch on what Joan said too, you know, um, <clears throat> about use of force or something. And like, the last thing that I want to do is to hurt someone. Like, that's not what I signed up to do. Like, I don't want to hurt people. I want to talk to them. But at some point when you're physically being targeted, being, you know, attacked, you're going to fight for your life. And, you know, being somebody that actually did have to fight for your life, I'm sure we will tell you. Uh, 2009, I had to jump on the, the bike path. It was me by myself, it was three bolts. I, and, you know, I had to fight for my life and I go back in camp and back in camp for like six minutes and 30 some seconds, something like that. You know, you're talking about you're wearing like, you know, 60 pounds of stuff on you. I'm like 5'5", five, five, 120 pounds, you know, at the time. I'm like chasing after these bolts, um, you know, for a while. You're like, with all the extra weight on you, when it. And then you have to fight for your life on top of that, you know, you can do what you have to do. Uh, do I want to hurt these people? No, but, you know, I mean, they almost took my eye off, you know, that, 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 that night. So, you know, with that said, you know, it's, it, it all comes down to training. And in order to train, you have to have time. Um, in order to have a better interaction with the public, you got to have training, and you know, how to go I mean, it, at the end of the day, it all comes down to public trust. And in order to have public trust, we have to be able to serve you better. And when it comes down to serve you better, we have to have this, you know, support. We have to have officers be able to do all that. Um, you know, training is minimal right, right now. We barely have any uh, training. We do what we can, but, you know, how do you have better officers if we don't provide the training that they need? There's that problem as well. I mean, you know, I left Vietnam in 1990, and I can tell you when I left over there, like the people in, in Vietnam, they hear the, the cops. They hear, you know, like, I would not want to go to the police over there and report something. Like some, you know, like if, if, if I see a police officer over there do something bad, I would not want to go to the police station and say, hey, that officer did something bad, whatever, because immediately you'd be targeted if you do whatever. And when I came here, you know, I lived here, I, you know, went to school here, I grew up here, and when I decided I want to, you know, join the police force, because I want to make a difference, you know, and this is the only PD that I joke, because I'm like, well, this is the most diverse place, this is where I can make the most, you know, um, of my skills, of uh, my language. So this is the, you know, so when I sign up, it's not to get people not hurt. So, you know, like, we're, like it's hard to serve the public when we don't have the resources and the means to do that. You know, like every single corner I go to, I want to make the best that I can do. I want to, you know, make a lasting impression. So that way, you know, the public, hey, you know, like, the police are not bad, but, Without the 
enough resources. We're all going to be put in a situation where we're going to be responding without backup, and we're all going to be, you know, defending for our, 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 our lives. Mm -hmm. So that, in turn, will, I think, will make it worse, not better. Why don't we move in this? This is thank you, uh, Sergeant Lynn, for sharing. Uh, move into you know I, I think there's some value in these conversations and moving into as much um, actual context as possible. So so I'm going to take us into real uh, experience because I think there's an opportunity to learn and the chief can let me know there's 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 boundaries and what we can talk about, but I think I understand them and can stay within those. The first thing I do want to share because I think it's important for the conversation and once again. Uh, you know, because it's being conversational, I think that uh, Joe Osakoro alluded to things, but I think there are some things he alluded to just to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about. So uh, Joe was one of the three officers who, uh, as part of the protest and everything else, was being, uh, it was being, the community was calling for his dismissal. So there's a video out there, uh, Oscar was involved in an interaction with a citizen, and it was uh, fairly widely criticized, and people thought he should have been fired for it. So I think it's important, and he put it out there, so we're all here, he's not hiding, he, you know, he's saying I'm here, um, and that he's willing to, you know, there's a lawsuit, so there are boundaries on what he can talk about, but um, I think it's important to know that he chose to be here in those circumstances, uh, knowing that that's uh, part of the background and something that, you know, he's dealing with. Um, so let's leave that because it's not really, we, we can't talk about that, but I think we can talk about other things. So, uh, for example, this idea of, uh, uh, both Officer Nguyen and, and, and Officer Coral talked about, um, I think, the, the public's understanding of do officers have a right to protect themselves? Do they have a right to go home, try to go home at the end of the day? And what that can look like, right? What does that look like? And what does the escalation, what does it mean when it's one-on-one? -on -one? So there, there are, you know, situations that I think that we now have, and, you know, I think they're out in the public, so um, I believe that we can um, talk about it, but for example, there was an experience, these are things that happened in, in town. So the other night, not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, there was, the police got a call, and they respond, and there was a, a gentleman who had a woman at, with a knife, and was holding this woman hostage uh, with a knife. So they arrived there, uh, and the person, now this is interesting, I would say that based on what was going on, and, and I think it's the background, the officers had reason to think that there could be some mental health stuff going on. But the person had a knife to another person's, you know, to threatening another person. So the mental health piece at that point, I think from the officer's standpoint, becomes secondary. Because safety becomes primary. So it's not that they're unaware, but they're not in a position at that point necessarily to deal with mental health, because their first thing is to protect the person who is in harm's way. So they interact, the person's yelling and gesticulating and talking, talking about hurting himself, talking about hurting the woman, talking about hurting the officers. So they do the work of getting the woman separated from the person. So now that's out of the way, but now they have this person. And the person is yelling and they're talking about shooting themselves, shooting the cops. And then apparently they reach down into something on the ground. It's a pile. We don't know what's at the pile. So you're there at this point because of the, the, the risk for danger, officers have their guns full. So officers are there with their gun trained on this suspect, and the person reaches into something. They have no idea what's in the apartment. They have no idea what's in the pot. I think it might be interesting for us to have a talk. What are you supposed to do? You're an officer. It can happen quickly. It could be two seconds, probably less. That person would pull out and shoot. You know, If they have a gun, like doing that could happen fairly quickly. It could go down fairly quickly. The officers don't know. They don't, they don't know there's a gun yet. But that's the kind of situation an officer has. Like, what, what do we as a community think the officer is supposed to do? Do they have to wait and make sure and wait for the hand to come out and wait to see what happens? Is that the standard? And I'm not trying to be funny. I'm serious because when I'm in this role and talking to officers, I ask myself, where, where's the line? What are they supposed to do? We can talk about what happened, but, but this, this is pretty, I, I think I described it pretty well. That, yeah, so we're there, so all of us are there. What, what are you supposed to do as an officer? The person has threatened, threatened to hurt themselves, threatened to hurt officers, was already putting a, a, a third party in harm's way, and you're there with a gun chained on them. You're at a distance because safety has you, you're spaced from them, so you're not gonna just tackle them. 
You're not going to be able to do any grappling or anything while they're reaching in there because you're removed because that's safe. What are we supposed to do? I'm not sure what the training requires, but I feel like it, it must be some type of tiered response, right? Like if it's, if you're out of direct harm's way, there's like a way to, to incapacitate the person that doesn't uh, necessarily permit a terminal outcome for the person who is endangering themselves and the other person who was held hostage. So I feel like maybe there's, maybe the officers can illuminate that for us. Is there a certain level of response in terms of different situations where you respond with the tools before you do with the gun, or you respond with the escalation tools before you use the taser? What is, what is that? that so, sort of like? so for that situation, um, there, at least when you have the knife, you're gonna have somebody who, who's, who's trained on that person with a firearm just in case they do pull a firearm or in case something turns into a lethal force situation. At the same time, we usually have another officer who is attempting to um, deploy a less lethal munition, which would be a 40 millimeter launcher, which should say uh, it's either a blue, black, or orange round. So it looks kind of like a grenade. When it hits, it's soft, but it obviously that velocity hurts um, in hopes that it will incapacitate that person. Um, but just to be clear, um, when, when an officer gets to lethal force, our goal is to incapacitate you with the firearm, not to kill you. That's always the goal. When we shoot somebody, our goal is to incapacitate you, not to kill you. Um, but in that situation, yeah, we would, it, it would have started, I wasn't there, I know a couple of the guys that were, um, but how we would have gone through that would have been with the knife to start with, if there's somebody who has trained in less than lethal munitions, they will be taking out either a 40 millimeter uh, launcher or a beanbag shotgun, so that we can hopefully, if we have to get to that point, we can use that prior to going to lethal force. Um, the problem is once you get to him saying, I have a gun, and then him reaching. Um, What's the training say? Well, it's, it's not really, it's, yeah, it's the training, but it's also, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. What do you think is faster, action or reaction? Action. Action, right? So the action of you pulling something out and pointing at me is gonna be faster than me reacting. The average person's perception and reaction to that perception, the amount of time it's gonna take you to take in the information and actually react to that would be one and a half seconds if you're really, really like trained on it. And even then, like, it can be slower than that. In that time, if I pull a firearm and shoot you, it's over. And I say it's over in the way that even if you hit me in the vest, you know, if I, if I get lucky enough to take a round in the vest, because although our vests are very big, there's a lot of area where you could a bullet can enter and still kill me. And, our, and they don't stop, you know, they only stop with the handgun, high, high velocity handgun rounds. They don't stop with rifle rounds and stuff, or shot, like a slug could even go through that dependent. Um, so the training tells me there, if you're reaching for, if you're telling me of a firearm and you're reaching, at this point, I'm, I'm justified at lethal force. So it's, it's ability, opportunity, and jeopardy is what we operate on in Vermont. So the ability would be that they have the ability to, to hurt me or kill me. Uh, the opportunity is the opportunity is the opportunity in front of them. The opportunity is that they have the opportunity because I'm right there. There's nowhere for me to go at that very moment because I have to be there. So they have the opportunity to kill me or hurt me. And then jeopardy, I'm in fear that either I'm gonna be hurt or ser seriously injured or killed or the person next to me will or somebody else in the area. So at that point, I've met all the prongs to get to lethal force, which is why at that point I may deploy it. Um, and the fact that those officers didn't is actually amazing that they, they had enough, at that time, whatever they were perceiving, they were able to not have to deploy lethal force. And I wasn't there, so you know, it's hard to say. Um, just hearing the story, perception when I roll on scene is, okay, I've got somebody with a knife, there's a hostage, um, this can go back really fast, so we're starting to split up who's doing what. So talking about tiered response would be, I'm gonna get a negotiator rolling if I can. I'm gonna get the lesson you can mention set up, a taser maybe if that's, an, if that's applicable, which tasers are great, but they don't work. Like even with the clothing you're wearing, it, a taser might not be effective on you because of that your shirt's a little more baggy, that, that may not be effective on you at all. Um, it may be effective on your leg, but not up here, and you have to have the, the connection, so. Um, so yeah, I'm rolling, I'm getting a negotiator rolling. I'm probably calling for even more units to kind of make the scene even safer if I can. We're gonna try to figure out how we can get the hostage out first um, and try to do try to do it with nobody in here. That's the goal every time. If I, can, if I can walk out of the scene and the person that was trying to hurt somebody, nobody got hurt out of that, that's amazing. That's, that's a great day. You feel really good walking away from that. You know, you did the right, you were able to do everything exactly right. Um, so yeah, that would be the plan. But unfortunately when, 
when the behavior dictates something else, like telling you you have a gun and then reaching for that gun, that changes the situation quickly. Yeah. I think part of it is, I want this, this ultimate, this community conversation that we're going to have over time, we're having it today, to result in more alignment between what the community would expect an officer to do and what they understand in their training would have them do. So if anyone else has a thought, so once again, the officers don't get to determine the circumstance. What we've said, this is actually happening. I'm there, I've said I'll shoot you, I've said I'll shoot myself, and I'm reaching somewhere where you don't know what's in there. Does anyone think that's the moment for de-escalation? What, what should that officer be thinking? And is it, and, and if that officer feels like, you know, it's either, because once again, there's non-compliance, right? So the person has broken the law. So it's not just like neutral, neutral. They have someone at knife point, they, and, and the officers are there trying to de-escalate and saying, you need to come quietly, and they're not. So they're, they're already in the wrong. And, and if anyone disagrees with that, let's say that. So now they're in there, and they're doing this. What is the officer supposed to do? Because there's this mismatch between community expectation and what officers do. So now we're the community here. What do we expect the officer to do there? Because that's what they were facing. Well, I'm, I'm just going to add one more thing to on top of that, too, is that uh, on top of all of this, this person has a history of, um, of violence and a history of, of fighting and uh, resisting with the police. And I'm sure that most of uh, the officers on the scene would have known that as well. So, adding the fact that you know, there's a threat of the gun and you know, calling in and trying to grab the gun, um, you know, so add that extra piece of knowledge on top of that as well. But how do we all open it? Because what could have happened is the officer could have shot. And what we'd have is in this moment, we could have a, a hurt or a dead person who probably if we, you know, did some due diligence, we find out had some mental health issues. And we'd have an officer who did it. And then we'd have that, you know, body cam that shows something that is, you know, less than optimal. And then we'd be here at the community talking about it. What, what would we say about what happened there? And how, 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 how are cops supposed to behave in that moment? Well, I think that's, that's the, because officers have a role that allows them responsibility to um, dispense justice in a moment, that they have, they have the potential to take someone's life in that moment. That is, uh, that, that puts a certain level of necessary integrity upon individuals. So when you're asking, what should be done to make sure that there's a positive outcome and a resolution? And maybe it should be looked at what type of techniques did the officers present employ to allow for no terminal outcome to take place? You know, they were able to somehow, even though this person was reaching for a gun, we've seen so many instances of times when people are without weapons killed. That's the main grievance that you have across the nation. So many people weaponless, harmless, not even ag aggressive, losing their lives unjustly. But here you have a person who's actively aggressive. I don't know the race of this person, but it might be a factor. I'm, I'm saying like, I'm just telling my mind, my, my thinking about it. So you have someone who's an aggressor, who's actively, obviously has a history with the police and violence, probably from uh, some mental condition probably some past trauma there. Somehow the officers are able to employ the training they've received and maybe there's their awareness of what's necessary in the moment to allow for uh, an outcome where this person wasn't harmed. So maybe those particular situations should be unpacked to look at what the officers are doing in those situations that allow for that positive resolution to take place. I think the problem with that is you can unpack that as much as you want, but that doesn't apply to another situation where a shooting does occur. Because in that situation, it's different. It, it may have been that they had just enough time that they didn't have to use deadly force, but in another situation where somebody did have to use deadly force, they didn't have that time. And I'm talking, I'm not talking seconds, I'm talking milliseconds. You know, it, it, it could be as simple as the officer on scene was already had their finger on the trigger, <laughs> was going to use deadly force, and then something changed and they didn't have to. And in another situation where they didn't have that, that extra millisecond to pull that trigger, those scenes could be almost the same, but very different. And that's that's the hard part. I think we should unpack the ones where they went right. 
and or where our peers went right because even even in those situations because we after situations like this we go back and we do unpack them we have what's called the after action report debrief about them and we sit and we ask ourselves what did we do right what did we do wrong what could we have done completely differently that would have made that scene safer faster how could we have done it better we do do that a lot i, I just did one two days ago um and, but yeah, that's the biggest thing. You sh we should always unpack these things, but you have to understand that you cannot apply one to another one like a, like a template. It doesn't work like that. They're just too different. I can't, there's no scene I've been on that's ever been exactly the same, even with the same person doing the same thing. It's always slightly different. And that's the hard part. And if I may, so, so the kinds of scenes, in, in, in the past year, in the, in the previous calendar year, there were 13 instances of people being unarmed who were killed by police. Um, and, and that's it's a terrible number. This incident could have been one of those. He did, was not armed. And when he went in, you know, was there a firearm in that room? No, there probably was not. I don't know that we actually were able to, I mean, we didn't get a warrant for the space, but there wasn't anything in the lungeable area where he could have obtained it. And yet his actions, as, as Director Dodson has pointed out, certainly put you in a position of saying, could lethal force have been used there? It could have been. It, we're, we're incredibly lucky that, that the training kicked in, that three officers there were there, that one officer was able to use a, a taser in that instance to prevent the other two officers from having to fire or to wait for him to, to prove whether he had that firearm or not. And that's a, a hard position to be in, to wait to see it and to decide, I'm, I'm, I'm going to wait to get shot before I do anything. And, and, Officers sometimes don't wait for that. And some of those things that we see around the country when we have those numbers of instances where people are shot and were unarmed are very similar to this situation. It's just that it did, that, that, that the shooting occurred and didn't happen here. We're lucky, we're lucky about that, but it's not just luck. It is training, it's, it's intent, it's what's in the officer's hearts. Every officer here has said that they don't take this job to hurt people or, or that they don't want to do those things. Yet another instance just uh, this past weekend, it had a very similar situation and outcome. Again, a person in that instance did have a handgun in his hand, and and officers were able to take him into custody without using their own firearms or without him shooting. So they happen, and then out of the you know the quarter billion encounters between police officers and citizens every year, where you have eight hundred thousand officers and you have. 330 million Americans, and they come into contact in one way or another a quarter billion times, 11 of those, and excuse me, 13 of those end up with somebody being killed who wasn't armed. About 1,000 end up with people being killed who are armed. Um, and that's terrible, and, and nobody wants those outcomes. And, and the after action reviews are designed to make certain that, that, we, don't, that we don't have those outcomes. Um, but, but they happen, and so, I think part of this, these conversations, uh, from the director's perspective and from my perspective, is, is getting an understanding from our community of what we want and what our thresholds are and, and just understanding for both sides of what the law permits, of what training says, and what our community's expectations are to push either of those, whether it's pushing the law, which takes a long time and is hard, or pushing training in new directions. Uh, um, those are things that we can accomplish together. And so, because I was really struck by what you said about the idea of, of, come, of, of not having people who bring this history and this weight and this burden to encounters being in all those encounters. How can we minimize the encounters that involve one party having all that burden? And, and that is a goal. But sometimes those encounters, even if that party isn't there, is still going to turn into something that's dangerous and violent. And what do we do then? What do we do for, for either side of the, of the party there? The, the party who is trying to, who's being helped, but also maybe dangerous, and the party who's trying to help and may be put in danger. Um, and uh, the community has to have these answers, these, uh, not answers, these conversations and questions so that we can all come together on it. So my question, you know, I'm wondering, you know, staying with these two events, because what, what I guess the question is, do we think this group of pretty diverse community members and police officers think we can get to a point where these two, these are specific things happened over the last two weeks. A person suffering from mental health issues, which is one of the categories of people that the community seems to be up in arms, that police do not respond according to community expectations, 
at time when dealing with people with mental health issues. So that's one issue that is very contentious. So I want us to get the contentious stuff in here. Another one is we have a shooting. A person actually shoots someone. That person uh, gets supported by officers. A lot of blood, a lot of bleeding, tourniquet. Could have been something that had gone awry. Police apprehend said individual. It seems like all, you know, it's, it's an illegal, but it seems like the positive ID, how the person responded, the gun, the casings, this is the person who did the shooting. So officers have this person surrounded. Uh, they are waving a pistol. So anytime they're waving, once again, both of these did not end in a shooting. But what I'm wondering is, could we have a conversation where the community and police are in the same place if the people had been shot? Because that's the thing, because unfortunately, that may, and it probably will happen. The world and crime and things with it will. It probably will happen at some point in this town. Can we survive it? And can we have a common understanding of what went down? So I'm waving a pistol. Someone's got a gun pointed at me. One of the officers feels like in that moment with adrenaline milliseconds that the gun points at them. And then it's a, I don't know, not a half a second, some amount of seconds till the round goes off. So they shoot the individual. Because the individual was non-compliant. They'd already shot someone. They had a gun. Officer tell them to put down the gun. They don't put down the gun. They wave it. It seems like they're going to shoot someone. And we shoot them. Could the, like, what would the community do with that? Is that just wrong? That officer needs to be dismissed. The police department is racist. We're going to get rid of people in the police department. But can, can we survive that? Because that's the question police officers are asking. And, and how do they do the job differently? If that's wrong, what, what's our, what are we telling them as a community? What do they need to do differently? In that moment, not some moment, but a guy has a gun, he's already shot somebody, and it's a black man. So I feel like, I mean, community expectations, right? So, so you have community expectations, you have department policy and trainings, then you have law, right? And so there's three different sets of expectations uh, for how officers uh, will act, you know? And so it, it's, there's like, you know, a level of expectation, right? When we watch TV, we see the guy jump through the air shooting two guns, flying through the air, all those shots go right on target, all right? So we have this expectation that the officer could shoot the gun out of the person's hand or something along those lines. Then we have, you know, policies which, uh, you know, uh, dictate when you can use uh, force. And then you have law which is generally less restrictive. It, it's basically the, there's higher expectations in the community and then lower expectations in the policy and the training and then lower expectations generally and the law, otherwise you wouldn't have any training, you just have law. So, so the training and uh, the foreign policy expectations are always gonna be higher than law. Otherwise you just have the law and that's it. Um, the community's expectations, you know, the, the guy that's you know, lunging for what he's saying is a gun, just shoot him in the leg, right? Or, or shoot him in the hand, you know? Or just tase him, right? You know, and so I, I think that it's easy uh, for, for the community to think, well, there, there's some alternatives, right? But um, you know, as Joe said earlier, we shoot someone to incapacitate them. Shooting someone in the leg doesn't incapacitate them, all right? That doesn't interrupt the signal between the brain uh, and, and, and the finger, all right? So they can shoot you. Um, to, to shoot a gun out of someone's hand, to hit someone's leg, which is actually a really small target, especially if they're moving, very, very hard to do, right? But, but the expectations, uh, I think, um, work against us, right? Like sometimes they help us. Uh, you know, people think that we're really good at our jobs, you know, and so, you know, that works in our favor, but it also works against us in that, in, in that situation. Uh, and as Joe also said, you know, you can't take one situation and perfectly apply it to another situation. So you can't have policy that dictates, you know, stringently how you, you know, act in every situation. And also, if you had that strict of a policy, you'd be breaking that policy all the time because it'd be too hard. It'd be too hard to have such a prescribed reaction to you know, one of 12 billion different circumstances that can happen. But I think we need to have, as you said also, what our community expects and what we actually do, I think they're pretty far apart. You know, and that's even, you know, in the evidence world, they call it the CSI effect, right? Where, um, you know, there's a crime scene and they, they you know, get the fingerprint and they scan it and immediately, boom, it, it gets a match, you know, like that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, if you're lucky, you get a fingerprint that's good enough that uh, you can do like a comparison, but actually just put in the system and boom, there's an act like it doesn't work. Yeah. So, so I feel like that's part of it, right. you know? Um, 
I saw it years ago. I don't know where it went. I don't know if it exists anymore. There was a there was a virtual reality set that you could go into. It was made. I forget who made it, but it was it was they put you in the in the in the in an officer's position dealing with two black males, and you had to determine how you would have handled that situation to give you the best perception from that person's perception. And he was, from what I remember, the video it wasn't a good video. It was it was done very poorly in the way of how the officer handled the situation. But it was that it was to get you in that perception, and that's the biggest thing that I think it's lost. Like I love Axon, the video cameras are the best thing in the world because they show more than ever what my report can say because I can miss things in my report when I try to write it. Um, when I try to recollect, I'm not going to recollect it correctly because I had a drone pumping in my system, um, and there's a hundred other things going. Um, like I think what a lot of people know is when when we get in these situations where there's adrenaline pumping, there's a couple things that happen. One really simple thing, you get what's called tunnel vision. It it literally makes your view this big. I don't see the things over here as well anymore. I'm focused on this specific thing. I get what's called auditory exclusion, so I don't hear everything I normally hear. You could be standing right here yelling at me to, to do something. I may miss that. But that same thing's happening for that person that I'm dealing with. So their behavior, if they're upset and their adrenaline's pumping, they now have tunnel vision, they now have auditory exclusion. So when I yell to them to put the gun down, they may not react accordingly. There's, the problem is there's no way to change that in that situation because unless I can bring their level down enough, I can calm them down enough. And sometimes we don't have the time to do that. When we actually can de-escalate somebody, when we have what's called time, distance, and cover, and we can de-escalate somebody, that's when we can do that. And we can slow that situation down. We can calm them down enough that they can think a little clearly, more clearly, and maybe their behavior will change. But perception is the biggest thing. And the question I always hear when I, because I watch, I'm constantly, and a lot of cops I work with, we're constantly trying to train. So we, we train by ourselves, like we train off shift, we train on shift if we have time. Um, we watch videos, new videos that come out um, that get you know torn apart and explained why this happened or why it didn't happen. Um, but one of the things I hear the most is, if you've seen any of the videos, and I'm, not, I'm not telling you to go watch these because they're traumatic, like they, you're seeing people being shot and stuff, but it's something that I do for training so that I'm understanding what's going on in the world. Um, it helps me try to think how I would handle that situation better, if, I, if there was a better way to handle it. Uh, one of the ones I've seen many times is, you know, the officer is dealing with somebody, they start running, they turn around with a gun, and they turn back, and then they shoot them. So what did they just do? They shot them in the back. And the question is always, why did you shoot them in the back? Well, that goes back to perception, and goes back to what I said earlier of, for me, the time that it takes me to recognize what that was, and then act on it, is just long enough that by the time I shoot, they're already turned back around. But in my head, they haven't done that yet. Uh, an example I'll give you is I was down on the inner veil looking for a, uh, an aggravated assault suspect. I found him with two other officers and I asked him to start walking towards me with his hands on top of his head. And when he did that, I saw that he had a gun on his head. And all I said was, do not reach for the gun, just keep your hands on your head. And out of habit, he reached for the gun to take it and throw it. He grabbed it, picked it up a little higher and threw it. When he did that, my perception was that he grabbed it and as he got to here, I was like, I'm gonna draw my gun because this is lethal force now. By the time I even got my gun up here, the gun was already on the ground. But my perception, it took me time to catch up to that. That's how it works. And that's one of the worst parts is why it can look so bad every time, or a lot of times. Is we're trying to catch up. And it's a human, it's, it's human, you can't change that. It's something, it's, it's in your head. You can't, you can't make that faster. You know, I'm, I'm taking in as much as I can and as fast as I can, and then I'm reacting to it. The problem is, is I'm a little bit behind actually, just like everybody else would be in that situation. Um, but that's why that happens. So I think there needs to be an understanding that it may, you, got, you have to add that in. And that's, that's the hard, the great thing about video is it gives you more of a perspective, but it gives you a lot less of a perspective because you don't have the sound, the smells, the adrenaline. So then it's hard to put yourself in that situation. You're just seeing it from a 2D view at that point. And you're seeing, and you're getting it from what's called hindsight. And it's really easy to, to determine what you would have done differently in hindsight. It's very hard in the moment. Um, and I think that's what needs to be talked about more is what was the perception of that officer at the time? What was the perception of that person at the time? Uh, I'm, I'm curious because we just downloaded a whole lot of stuff um, to you folks about being a police officer and stuff like that. I'm interested in like what your perspective is like hearing this, but also, you know, what as police officers, you know, what, what your view is now you've heard some of this, but I'm, I'm sure like there are things that we, we, I know there are things that we can do differently. Like 
how can we best go about taking like like uh, <clears throat> Eric, what you said was like the public your perception and our perception and and coming together like a change on both parts like that comes together has a better understanding of that because I mean like I said you basically just got a patrol procedures uh, lesson. <laughs> um, but right I'm on. curious like. You know, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of stuff from out there. I think that uh, first and foremost, uh, we're all human. And I think that at the end of the day, you know, whatever profession we're in, you know, we're, we're looked upon as superheroes in whatever eyes, our kids' eyes, the community, the public, we're superheroes. And, you know, superheroes are supposed to be tough and strong and don't crack, right? But there, there's also the other side to that story. And I think, and, and, and first and foremost, like, I gotta, I just have to say, this is really helpful. This is like, everyone here right now, especially, I, I haven't gotten a chance, and I just really appreciate your vulnerability. Um, I always say that vulnerability is the cousin of growth. I think that us as humans, that, you know, it's it's a lot to decipher in that, in that millisecond a tenth of a second. And, you know, you have to go through the channels very swiftly, mm -hmm. very rapidly. And and that's something to say that, you know, I, I, I take my hat off to get to that point and being able to get out on the force and serve our community. So being able to get to that, to that, to that stance is, is, is an accomplishment of saying that you're qualified enough to take care of our community. So, you know, I respect that and I give that the highest, the highest uh, acknowledgement. Um, I think that, you know, as a whole, as a community, and as I was saying before, I think we all, you know, at the end of the day, wanna, you know, walk out our doors and, and know that, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, we're, we're gonna be safe, we're gonna come from, and have the potential to come back home, right? I think everyone walks out with that, with that charge of energy. And, you know, I have to be honest, you know, you guys, you officers, uh, women and, and, and male, you know, you, you, you're catching the heavy. You're catching the heavy because the world assumes, you know, uh, that you guys got it all figured out. And, you know, and I get it. And you're talking to one who's been a victim of police brutality when I was 13, just because I was walking down the street, you know? But my perception, my lens doesn't allow me to, or, or won't allow my soul, my spirit, won't allow me to say all officers are bad because of what happened to me when I was 13 years of age. So I think, what, what are we really looking for, right? What are, we, what, are, what are we really craving and asking for? Mercy. We just want a little mercy. It's that simple. Those we, those community members or cops? Community, everyone. Everyone. It's not individualized. I think it's collectively and it's a whole. You know, don't, you know, we're not looking to for handouts or looking to be put upon. We, we just want mercy and grace. And I think mercy and grace comes with a certain level mm -hmm. of integrity and accountability and also being held at that at that standard to where you know the hardest thing to do is is to say sorry and do the right thing when no one is looking and i think as as a as a community we kind of want that assurance we want we want we want to feel that we want to feel that not just like think that but we want to really feel that and i think that's the gap that we have to kind of fulfill because if, if, if that's not available for on the table, we got a long way. And I think that's that's the, that's the road we need to take. So I want to push here. This I like this. I love mercy and grace. And I, I wonder if, if you have ideas or other people. But in, in this moment, so I presume you didn't say, Taurus Joe, but that you did not shoot the individual in the interview. No. So what, what I'm wondering is can we – Community and please get to the place where with the gentleman with the knife 
and the reaching in the pile, or the gentleman who shot someone, went down Riverside Ave, turned his car over, was waving the gun, or Joe's guy on the, in the intervale, can we have any of those have an outcome where an officer shot the individual? And we, as a community, could be the same place as the cops, where this is awful, this is horrible, but we don't know how it could have played out differently. It just played out on the wrong side of things, but the fact that Joe shot somebody who pulled a firearm to this point with the reaction and adrenaline that we don't end up protesting and calling for his dismissal and thinking of the horrible cop. Because that's where we are now. I don't think our community could survive that. I think that if, if, if one of our cops shoots anyone, and these men and women go to work every day thinking that, they, they can't imagine they could do their job and shoot anyone and survive it. The community would not be able to see that shooting as something that happens when you're doing this difficult job they're doing. And so it makes it hard for them to do it. That feels like a, that feels like a stalemate. It feels like we're stuck because either, any one of those three situations could have easily ended that way. It seems, I don't know, that, that's my thing. That it seems like it could have easily ended that way, but it doesn't feel like our community could have survived that. We couldn't have been together as a community in our, um, you know, in our assessment of what had gone down there. And that, that gap, because it feels like it's going to happen. The world being the way the world is, and the cops are scared to death post-COVID, spring, that stuff's going to go down. And one of these times is not going to be in the knee. It's going to be central body mass. And someone's going to be dead. And what's our community do? It doesn't seem like we're in a place right now where we can get through it together as a community with mercy and grace for all involved. And, and I don't have the answer. I, I am asking this. This is a... On six months, I've been doing this job very difficult. It's been very difficult for me. This, this, this experience we're having here is like solace or, or you know, in, in, a, in a thing that's been very difficult just to feel like I'm connecting with human beings and having a conversation where at least we all have some degree of trust and, and believe that perhaps we all want the same end. I feel that here. It's really important. But I don't have that answer. And, and I, I'm fearful of how we'll, we'll deal with that. Because it does strike me, dealing with every day, hearing the stories, that it's going to go down. At some point, there's going to be an outcome that's really difficult. I feel like trust, you, know, you said it kind of, uh, just now. I, I think trust, you know, that's, you know, when, when you have, when there's power, when there's a power dynamic, right? Like I, like I said, uh, you know, last week I had an instance with a police officer in a different state where the person was, being unreasonable, and, and you know, I was, I was, I was just, you know, Joe walking down the sidewalk at that point with a cup of coffee. Um, I could feel the power dynamic, you know, and when you have that power dynamic and the lack of trust, I, I think that's that's when things, uh, you know, that that's when it's bad, right? Um, and I think that's where we are. I, I think the trust isn't there. Um, I, you know, there might be some people that trust us, but but not everybody. And there's a lot of people who have some valid reasons to not trust us be them historical, be them personal experiences, be it stuff that they saw on TV, stories that they've all heard. Um, so how do you develop that trust? Um, and I'm just gonna say it, you know, call me pessimistic, we're not gonna have everybody's trust. Um, there's just too much against that. But how can we find the people who need it most, the people who are most vulnerable, um, the people who, if they need help, they need to call us, People who, if they're getting pulled over, they're afraid that that's going to be their last day on the earth. You know, the people that are being impacted most, how do we help those people have trust when there's so much that's outside of our control to do that? And I think it takes community to have trust. So we need more community involved. I think also uh, ours first is like when we have an incident where somebody does get shot, um, is that we can't release everything right away and then it looks like we're trying to hide something and we're not. It's just the we can't, for the sake of the case, release everything right off the bat. And, okay. There's, there's like no way to make that yes. faster. I don't know. I mean, I'd rather a case be a little weaker than the police department being turned down. Oh, or right. being injured. I mean, maybe we need to decide. And Kyle's asking, yeah. what can we do? Maybe, we do? maybe we change the rules a little bit. You know, how we balance. Yeah. True, but if somebody was walking around with some sort of weapon that they've already used on somebody, how in the world did we get this far? And how did that person not have take responsibility for their actions? And why are they the only ones being scrutinized? I, I'm just putting it out there. So, so I think that's critical of critical importance. 
Um, I'm going to ask that we bracket that. It's, it's critically important and part of why I might argue this is Kyle's editorial. We are left um, putting all of this pressure on officers is because other parts of the community, I don't know that we've had the robust response to vulnerable citizens, people who struggle upstream so that hopefully we can be more proactive, right? But that's a separate thing. And once again, it's not the, and I think, once again, Kyle's editorial, in the moment when the person's pulling the gun is not the place for the police to be dealing with that, right? All that upstream stuff, in my opinion, there's no, there's no latitude at that point to be dealing with that. There's something immediate, right? But I want to go back to any other community members, not actually, does in, do any of the community members here trust the police? I trust BPD. And if that's a no, do you have a sense? What, what should we do? What's the path to get in there? Because one of the things is we're 78 effective, so we have less officers, and I don't think it's changed trust. So we did one thing, and, and I don't think it had any impact, if, if not a negative. So we did one pretty dramatic thing that has a whole bunch of another set of consequences, but that didn't change trust, I'm going to argue. So to the degree that we want trust, to the degree it's important, what do we do? I think trying to, figuring out a way to have connections without it being with a phone call. Like prior, like, you know, there was the whole talk about, you know, the connection in, in schools and breaking down those barriers. Which is a start, but, and to answer your other question, I, I do, there is some trust, but it's very cautious because there are some old habits that not everyone per se here have, you know, maybe practiced or not practiced, whatever. But, you know, the, the few incidences in my life or that I've seen or interacted with, unfortunately, they've kind of, they're still there, you know? And um, so, yes, I do to some degree and, and hope that the rest of it can, you know, be fixed or, not, you know, changed or whatever. So, so Tracy does trust to some degree. She's working on stuff, some things in her background. Anybody else? Vincent, Raj, Lucy, you guys trust the police? These police? Brown and Company I mean, I think I always had, like, fairly good experiences in schools in my, like, for, like, the school district growing up with the police that were there. Like, whether it was on, like, career day or something like that, like, I feel like they were present, they were, like, engaging, mm -hmm. and that was good. And, but I also recognize that's my personal experience. Like, I don't want to speak for anyone else who might have had difficulties or who might have seen the police who were in the schools in a different light. I think it's really case by case for different students. But my experience is overall positive, and I think that that fostered a lot of trust. And that's only to put people on the spot, but this is, this is the stuff, right? If there's low trust, we got community members here. How's this group community members feel about the police? No, I, I, I have a great relationship. Uh, one of my good friends, Officer Mike Neiman, uh, great guy. I, I don't know a lot of other gentlemen on the force. I mean, we're all brothers from different mothers, you know, but I think at the end of the day, what we, what we also can't go away from is, is the realities of, of certain situations that, that do arise. And I think what the community wants to know and wants to feel is that, you know, there's accountability for them as well, regardless if they have on the suit, uh, if, if they walk with a badge, just like me, I have to be accountable for my actions. And I think that ultimately, you know, regardless of, you know, like, not, like this take any situation, like it doesn't matter, like, like race take all, every, all, every, all of the attributes out. They just want accountability. You know what I'm saying? They just want people to be accountable for what they're doing. And, 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 I, and I'm gonna say it like, and not be protected by the quality immunity. And that's where I feel the community and not all, um, it's never all, 
right? I can never say it's not. It's not fair to say all. That's the, that's just mathematically not even equivocally correct. So, but there there needs to be accountability, and I think if if the community sees that for incidents and for situations, I think I think the trust will 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 will, will uh, increase. You know, but that's all. Like I said, on an individual basis, you know, I can't speak for everyone. Me personally, I have no quarrels. I actually have good friends on the force. I support them. I support, you know, what they do and how they, you know, wake up every day just like I do, get out of my bed and, and, and try to do the best of job as they go about starting their day. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. But as far as, you know, on a bigger, bigger scale, I feel not just here, but globally, uh, they want to feel uh, a sense of uh, they want to feel uh, like they're like 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 they have the same accountability as everyone else. Yeah, I think that um, part of, that's part of the reason we're here is to, to cultivate that to try to plant the seed um, to open the doorway in this moment to see what's possible, to re-examine our histories and our experiences and look with a deeper lens to see what can transform. You know, I, I can't disassociate uh, the connection of the police to its root origin in catching my enslaved ancestors, that's reality. And I wouldn't. And if that's not a crucial component of people's training in taking this position, then that should be examined. Otherwise, it's not sincere serving and protecting all people. So there's things that have to be deconstructed, that have to be connected to how we inherit traumas from our history where we see each other, the way we see ourselves. Um, I, of course I want to go home safe. Of course I want my daughter to be protected when I'm not around her. And I have no malice toward any of you. I have no ill will toward anyone. But I feel like we have to connect to the human being behind the badge. We have to connect to the human being behind this officious narrative that that's kind of puts it in our heads that all of police are one way when we know that's not the case by own experience, but trauma speaks louder. You know, we're not Chicago or, or LA or some larger quote unquote urban city, but we still have our own history and this is a part of America. We're at a crucial moment right now just because this is grown to a, a state where you can't ignore it anymore. And it has to be brought to bear in, in ways that allow for people to express their experiences with the social construct of race and how they see themselves and see each other, what they were taught and mistaught, honestly. Because otherwise there's no real basis for trust there. I feel like that's kind of why I'm here. <coughs> The way I kind of look at it is, you know, if, if something's happened in the past or something's happened in a different part of the country and a police officer in Burlington were to say, I didn't do that. That's not my problem. I'm going to do my job. Uh, it, my analogy would be, well, if you're a painter, right, and it's your job to paint the outside of the house and it's raining, you're like, well, that's, I didn't make the rain. You know, that, that circumstance is out of, out of my control. My job is to put paint on the wall. And so you're painting in the rain. You know, I feel like that's, you know, similar to police well, people are ignoring all those. Definitely, but people are experiencing their own individual um, connection to, to to what's happening. So as, as, as unjust as it feels for officers to feel like I'm being put upon right now, I didn't do what these other officers did. Well, that's the experience of black men every day. From childhood, from school onward. You're put into a box and perceived as hostile and treated differently on a regular basis. So that's a connection now that you have with us. So if it doesn't feel good, think about how it feels for us. 
Think about the human beings that you're serving and dealing with on a daily basis through a deeper lens of experience and you can understand what people are going through and that can humanize you in the moment. Now, of course, when there's extreme moments and, you, and it's life or death, yeah, but, it's, but life is consisting of many different small moments. And it's what's, what you do like this is one. What we do with it right here, right now is key. So if we're willing to come together and put our hearts out there and be willing to understand each other, to encourage other people to come to the fore and express their voices and their grievances, maybe we can learn and grow something valuable together to, that allows for more to be possible. I, I think you're right. I think we have to trust you enough to be able to say what you're saying and understand that you're not taking it personally. You're not throwing it personally at us. You're saying, this is why I feel the way I feel. I believe what I believe. And we have to trust you enough as well to be like, yeah, I can take that. I can have you tell me that. And I understand. And, and that makes me a better person, a better police officer, realizing like, it's not a personal thing. Like I have to understand where you're coming from. Like you're saying, like when you look at police, this is, you know, you look all the way back through history. Like I have to understand and trust in, in you enough. Like just cause you're saying that doesn't mean, oh, he hates me or she hates me or, you know, all of a sudden I'm like, they think like I'm that person in the past. I'm not, but I need to understand that that also colors the lens of how you're looking at the situation we're in. So yeah, it's, it's our trust in you to be able to be able to say those things and and us to trust ourselves to be able to separate ourselves from that you know like you said uh, one of the first conversations i said when you told me like people you know people of color don't see burlington police they see the police like everything that's you know all through history that's what they see it's not me personally but that's the representation I think from from our officers, what we can take away from this and what we can work on too is was the other thing you said about now I know I know you folks I know you know I know you might see on the street like hey how's it going like if you had to call me and I had to come deal with the situation you're in it's a whole different dynamic now like oh I remember you know sitting in a gym and speaking to Lucy and now she's having you know this this problem like it's more of a it's more of a personal thing like I don't walk in there and you know. And it's like an unknown, like you're unknown to me, like, well, I don't know if I'm going to trust what they say or something like that. Like, the more connections officers could make like that and know people in their community, um, I, I think that's something that maybe as police, yeah, we've kind of gone away. It's hard when, yeah, like Joe was saying, like you start pulling yourself into the shell and it has actually the opposite effect of what we really should be doing. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's really important. You know. It's relational and it's humanizing, and yes. we all offer each other something when we're courageously vulnerable and authentic about what we experience. You know, even outside the world of this conversation, as far as officers and community members, just being authentic. That's what children respond to, but that's what people respond to. Like you know, when somebody really likes you, and when they don't, when they're being passive aggressive with you, it's in the tone, it's in the behavior, it's in the way you engage with people. So if we're willing to be sincere with each other here and now, and this is not a show for somebody on WCAX to watch later, and it's about what we do with that genuine offer and how we make strides and meaningful movements towards chance moment and the way the narrative is played out in people's minds by our relationships, by the way we connect with each other and recognize who we are, that seems really vital. So that's the thought. This is, um, these conversations for me are just incredibly powerful. Um, I want to express my gratitude to all of you. I want to really thank Megan. Thank you. She's been sitting here. She got here three. Um, I think the fact that we captured this is critical uh, so people can see what a different kind of conversation can look like. Uh, thank you, Catherine. If anyone uh, is available, Catherine, talk to you, but I think she'd love to maybe talk to some people. As we're done, I'm going to try to bring us to a wrap up here just out of respect for people's time. The conversation can go on endlessly, and it needs to, not tonight, right? But we need to continue it. I do have some thoughts about it. So one, you know, this has been something that um, has been the, uh, the biggest takeaway uh, from my experience of six months. Uh, 
living in the police department, going there every day, and also still dealing with the community, is the importance of having the kind of connection that Rajni talked about. Um, I have such deep um, respect and admiration for how Rajni moves through the world. Uh, it's a gift to be able to speak his truth and to, to say at the content level, I would argue the same thing as some other people in the community are saying, but to have it lead to DC LeBrec wanting to open himself up, wanting to understand Rajni, wanting to say, I need to be able to hear that. That's what we want. We want that to happen. And, you know, interestingly, there are, there are you know, there's some people who uh, have um, uh, have cynical sense of uh, this coming together and me pulling together, why I chose people. Well, well that's why I chose, uh, you know, Raj, that's why I chose all of you, because I had a sense of how you would have the conversation, not what you would say. Everyone was free and actually encouraged to come here and say what you have to say. But I think the way we've all said what has had to be said in here has allowed for more listening, more hearing, more taking it in, more sense that I'll come to the next conversation, all things which I think we need. I would ask people two things. So, so I'm, I'm coming to a close in this role officially in the police department. I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here at the Y. Uh, I've talked to, you know, I think it's important here. We've got the mayor. Thanks, Mayor Rowanberg, for coming. Uh, we got the chief here. Um, I believe, in my opinion, we need to continue this. I don't have all the answers for how we expand it, and so I'm leaving, I'm, I'm putting it out to this group. Do people think there's value in this, and what's it look like to expand it? I do think it's important to think about how we do it, but that um, some of the folks who, at least in my observation, have not necessarily to this point been having a conversation like this, but they have a perspective that's important and it's gonna be critical for us to move forward, right? The numbers are, uh, Moreau, you went 43 to 42? So I, I don't know how deep and like what the 42 all thought, but at some level, um, uh, you know, the, the person who got the 42 has been uh, leading a charge and showing up certain ways. And I think that we as a community need to engage that perspective. We have to figure out a way to engage that perspective. And I hope we can engage that perspective in the tone and the, the way that we've been able to establish here. Because I think that uh, ultimately we want every stakeholder in this city to be able to say their piece and be heard. And then we just grapple as a community and figure out where we get to. Um, so I guess I'm putting it out to all of you as an appeal to be thinking about it. I'll stay involved. I'll be continuing to work with the mayor and the chief and supporting how I can. The mayor, I will imagine, is going to be coming out with some uh, thoughts in the not too distant future about kind of his thoughts for the next piece of the work, uh, how this role and this work and this conversation um, gets moved forward. And, and so be looking out for that. And, and, uh, and, and hopefully all of you can be, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Ambassadors, but, but people who want to help the mayor and that help is to engage the community in a productive dialogue about police transformation. Not that you have to agree with the mayor, but that you see yourself as someone who wants to help him because I trust that that's what he wants. He doesn't want to silence anything. He doesn't want to have it his way. He wants to understand the will of the community and he wants to have the positive, most healthy, most trusted, most accountable police department that he can have. And I believe that John Murad, Eric Crowderville, Mindwin, Wade Lebrecht, and Joe Cora want the same thing. I believe that. Other people may not believe that. I believe that that's true. And I think, because uh, it, it suits them, quite frankly. It's their self-interest, right? That, they don't want their current work conditions. And Vince you know, spoke to that. Anyone can see the police department does not want its current work conditions. And they don't want to see, I'm, you know, I'm not you know, speaking out of turn, but Sergeant Wen came, I'll show you that I really appreciate it. He just sat down. 16 years in, he's got four left till he's able to retire. And he's not going anywhere. He made it clear. He came here to be in Berlin. He's not going anywhere. But he's, he's concerned. And uh, he's sad. He's sad. His colleagues are leaving. His colleagues are beleaguered and despondent about the circumstance, and it hurts him. It bothers him. He doesn't want that to be the case. But he doesn't have the answer. He doesn't know how to solve it. And what I take is that's why he came here. He's like, maybe this will help. So I'm willing, you know, he, the guy, you know, people who are in the department, these guys work hard. I'm often leaving. This guy's still there. This guy's still there. 
people put in the time and, and they, they got a lot of heart and soul in this. And so, you know, I just hope we can kind of dig in as a community and do the hard work of coming together and extending a little trust. Like, there was a good book a while ago, like, I'm, I'm not a, that well on, some of you be better on Christianity, but like, uh, you know, hope is a faith in the unseen, right? You gotta, you gotta leap. Sometimes you can't have all the ducks in a row. You gotta, you gotta take a little bit of a leap before you have all the substantiation that the leap was warranted, right? Or you never get there if you're, if you're careful, and if you wait till every possible way that the Burlington Police Department could be perfect and anti-racist and anti-everything and perfectly procedurally and perfect decision making. Ooh, that's, that's, gonna, that's a hard standard if that's the only way you'll ever extend a little good faith and extend a little trust. But sometimes trust begets trust, right? In here, these officers, this is a better conversation than police have about this moment than I've seen anywhere else. There's no other place I've been in six months where police are as vulnerable, they're as honest, they're as giving, give and take as in this room, period. Definitely no city council meeting or police commission meeting or joint committee meeting. Hasn't happened. The, the way that people talk in here, singular. That's what we want. We want to elicit that. We want to bring that out. I think these are, you know, these are my opinions. But we got to engage. But we got to engage people who, for whom it's not as easy. Right? There's some people who aren't in a place right now where they're ready to have a conversation quite like this. And we got to be able, I think we got we to gotta manage that. We got to figure out what to do with that, you know? I like this, you know, we got a nice nucleus here. So, so this, you know, this group has modeled something, and now we have, thank you again, Megan, we have something that we can say, well, this is kind of what we're talking about. You know, not what is said, but how it's said. You say what you need to say, but if you say it this way, it's probably going to go a little better. And, uh, and just, if I may, no, to, to build into the future and to keep this going, and that's absolutely something that I, I am hopeful that we can do, I want future iterations of this to focus on something that you brought up, Ronnie, which is if the officers feel beleaguered, there's a people who feel beleaguered, and it is a much, much longer situation, and it is, it's got deeper, deeper roots. How can those two things come together in a sense of, of, of understanding on both sides without saying that there is a true comparison there, that the scope and the scale are the same. They're not commensurate. But how can we understand from that both parts of, of this equation? Uh, and it's not just two. It's, it's all parts of this equation, because there's so many parts of this equation that is a community. And how can we build on that? And that's what I hope that we can develop in the ones that go forward. And that's what you've been saying for, for the time that you've been in this role. And, and this really is a culmination of that that can't be a culmination in the sense of it's the end. It's got to be this first step. So. And, and the chief helped me. When I speak and I talked about the difficulty that Sergeant Wynn's having, it's, it's not meant, and I fear people could hear and, and so he corrected. It's not instead of. It's not like, well, you know, if you're about the community, police are hurting. It's trying to get people to understand that there's humanity, you know, at One North Island. Right? And there's, there's people in there who care just like the community and they feel and that if we can recognize that also, not instead of, it doesn't, it doesn't supplant community trauma, community fear, uh, but, it, but, it, but, it, but I think if we add it to the mix of what we're trying to manage, it'll just be better. So I'd love to offer any, any last comments and then Rosny, if you're willing to, I'd love for you to lead us in our, uh, our kind of ending prayer. I really appreciate that. But, any, yeah, yeah, please, Joe. The only thing I want to say is I appreciate, be, I appreciate being here. Like, I appreciate being here with all of you and actually listening and li you listening to me. But I really appreciate hearing it. I, I learned some things today um, and definitely helped me open my mind some more. <laughs> new perspective because I know that I, I have so much to learn. Um, but the biggest thing that I've noticed in our department in the last year is I have friends that plan on giving 25 years to this, this city and now don't think they can do that anymore. And I would like to see that change. And this is why I came today for that reason and also so that we could create that connection so that I could get more of my friends to come here who are thinking about leaving and change their mind. Because I think that, you know, I don't think that they really want to leave. I just think that they feel kind of hopeless that they can't do anything to, to make it better. They don't feel like they can do anything to make it better. So I'm here for them, but I'm really here because I want to see the community trust us again. And I hope that, um, 
we can keep doing this. Any last thought, folks? Please. I just want to take this uh, occasion to, to thank Kyle for, for your leadership and for being willing to, to step into this role and, and to take this on. Um, and uh, you have had a vision of the way to have this conversation. And, and I have sensed in the hour I've been here that um, your intuition that this is, a, this is the type of conversation we need to have is, is right on. Uh, I, uh, <clears throat> Rodney, the way you uh, articulated the responsibility that really is incumbent on um, everyone who works for the city, on police officers, to understand the context and the history uh, of police interactions with all members of the community is is uh, was so well said, and it's, it's something we've been groping towards. And I, I, the way you immediately responded, Eric, too, with the uh, your analogy, um, it gives me real hope that there, that there is a, a way we can build a, a, mutual, a mutual understanding that's necessary to move through these years of, of churning and chafing and, and really not having a consensus about how we do law enforcement in this community. It gives me hope that there's a there's a path there. So thank you all for, for participating in this. And we have a, a long way to go, but this is far from done, but being here, being able to observe this does, does give me hope. And I do I want to thank you, Kyle, for, for stepping into this role and taking on. It was, it was not an easy thing to do. I'm really glad you did it. I hope, hope, hope the community um, sees the value in what you've done here, too. Thank you. Thank you, man. I want to say it's been an incredible privilege, right? I, I raised three sons here. Uh, me and their mother raised three sons, and Burlington's been really good to the Dodson family. It's been good to me professionally. Uh, I've got incredible relationships. You know, this is this is what, like, I groove on this, right? I, you know, it, I'm the only person in here who knew everybody. And, and that's my, like, that's that's my, my high. My thing is I love connecting. I love being able to uh, hopefully take relationships and, and create new relationships um, and, and that's, that's, that's my thing. That's what I really uh, enjoy doing. So uh, as difficult as it's been, uh, it's also been a privilege. I, I now have a, a, you know, something that I think is rare, which we need to remedy in this moment, is it's, it's a hard place to develop the relationships in the police department, right? Because as Joe said, you have that, so for so many, you have that one reaction with them in the public that's not ideal. Uh, and there's all sorts of safety and security issues around the building. But I like Eric's push, and keep pushing us, Eric. Like, policing is arguably a little bit worse than the next place of accepting, like, this is the way it's always been. we got to be this way. And no one says, like, well, why does it have to be that way? Like, there's some things that are accepted as it has to be this way. And if you really unpack them, peel away the layers, and then you'd be like, well, actually, we can do it, and it won't impact security. It won't impact these things that you bring up excuses. It's just we're comfortable doing it that way. And doing it some other way might achieve some goals that we want. And so this openness to doing it a different way. So I, I do think it's both ways. Being on the inside, I think there's things that people accept as it has to be this way. I'm not so sure. All the things that are, they always have to be that way. Just an openness uh, to pushing on that. I have a request that people, so part of what the mayor's asked me to do, appropriately so, and I think this kind of thing is coming out of that, is um, I'm to and my report to him is to get back to him about training and trainings that would happen. If people have thoughts that have come up in here and you're like, the police department needs to do X. They need to do this thing. I personally, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a bias. I love Rodney. Rodney's working with the Y. And there's something about everyone's responded. There's some kind of love, soul, heart. Something that Rodney has that I find impacts people. It, it affects people. You feel that sense. And the same thing the same content uh, can be used differently, can be worked with differently, because there's something happening at a human level. Um, so, so I think there's maybe some possibilities you know, down the road. Uh, I will probably suggest that. But this is a request. If you have an idea, a sense of some things you think it would make sense for the Burlington Police Department to engage in, please send them my way, uh, because I'm compiling those things, and I want to be able to offer that to the city and to the mayor. Lastly, something came up last time that I think is important that 
that was really a really important point, and that's the sphere and understanding. So uh, Vince last time said, I just want to leave my house in the morning. I want to feel safe. I want to feel like my kids are safe. Yes. And then there's a question. So I'm thinking, I'm with the officers, and the officers are like, well, I, some officers, some conversation would be like, well, really, Vince, the reality is that, like, two random young black kids and a random black dude, statistically, the times that they've left their house in Burlington and been unsafe is limited. There aren't very many examples in Burlington of that group of people suffering something physical. Now, the psychic, let's get the, the aggressive, but that day. And I'm just getting statistical. So people are like, and this is the conversation. Well, in the same way, then also the Breck and Officer Johnson's not here. We're talking about how, you know, Kelsey Johnson and Officer Johnson came in the Y. She's like, I know where all the exits are. And then she talked about when I go to a restaurant, I tactically position so I can sit and I can see all the exits and see what's going on. And so in the same way, I said to her, I was like, I'm not sure, Officer Johnson, that there's ever been an officer targeted at a restaurant or anywhere in Burlington where someone came after them in such a way that it makes sense as some kind of kind of uh, clear and present danger that you have to tactfully position yourself as you move around Burlington. But it doesn't stop the officers from feeling they need to do that. And it doesn't stop them from feeling unsafe. And how do we all own that? How do we own the fact that there's some set of things that we've lived through, that we've been traumatized by, that we've been trained, that cause us to, to have these feelings that when we pick it apart and push, we might argue they're not particularly rational doesn't make them not real, and doesn't make them not something we have to deal with. And, and that part of, in this moment, I don't have the answers, but the more we honor that we are feeling creatures and beings that have these things in our heads and in our hearts that don't necessarily make linear, logical, rational sense, but they're real, and the more we have the capacity and the space to deal with them, we'll be better off. So that metaphor. Any last word? We're going to have Raj and Colts out here. Do you have anything you want to say, Catherine, about who you want? Would you like to have people? Yeah, if I could have somebody from the police department and then another community member would be great, please. Sounds yeah. good, Meg. You want to say anything? So much. It's <laughs> not my job. Okay, all right. Well, everyone, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how we can access it out and what happens with that. Okay, great. Rod? Awesome. Ready? Please stand. I don't really say take hands, but I know we can't do it. So maybe it's in spirit. Please repeat after me. May those from under our feet, may those from under our feet, feet, breathe the warmth of community unto us. Breathe the warmth of community unto us. So the peace and creativity we seek. So the peace and creativity we seek. Mount our bodies and sits on the chairs of our hearts. Mount our bodies and sits on the chairs of our hearts. Spreading joy and love around us all. Spreading joy and love around us all. Ashe. 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 All right. Thanks, folks.